Thank you once again, and greetings to all those guests and visitors we have, those who might be tuning in online and those who may be tuning in a little bit later on. You know, I think we're all very anxious for this pandemic to be over with, but I think there's also a few things that, uh, you know, we've learned along the way. For example, I was watching something on my computer screen the other day and I made the comment to my wife and I said, this movie is boring and all the actors are ugly. And she said, that's not a movie, it's a Zoom meeting. Those aren't actors, those are your coworkers and your mic's still on. <laughs> No, that didn't happen, thankfully. <laughs> Some of the compliments, you know, that have come out of, of this pandemic. Well, I really like your mask, or that's a lovely scent of hand sanitizer you're wearing. <laughs> but my favorite one is this. It says, when this virus is over, I still want some of you people to stay six feet away from me. <laughs> uh, those are pretty funny, even. Well, you know, coming up into the Passover night too much observed, we can't help but think about the history of ancient Israel, how they were brought out of Egypt through the Exodus, how they went on to conquer many nations and go and inherit eventually the Promised Land. They became a, a world empire, albeit briefly. They, they built the Great Temple. But unfortunately, we know that eventually they would begin to stray away from God's word and the consequences that came from that were very, very serious. The result was a conquered and scattered nation because of the division that occurred there within ancient Israel. Today, I want us to take a look at the beginning of the end for the ancient kingdom of Israel and see if we can learn some lessons from that initial split. The split, as you probably know, involved two principal players at the very beginning. That's Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Uh, now, contrary to popular belief, uh, they were not brothers. They were not related in any way. Uh, Rehoboam was the son of Solomon and the legitimate heir, so to speak. Jeroboam was a strong and capable leader in uh, Solomon's government, and he's often accused of uh, starting a rebellion and division. A closer look at the story will reveal there's a little bit more to it than that, and that as you read through this story, sometimes those that we think are the good guys <laughs> actually turn out to be the bad guys, and some that we presume to be the bad guys maybe aren't so bad after all. By reviewing this story today, I'd like for us to learn to discern during division. To discern during division. Now let me preface this message before we get into it. Uh, this is not some sort of a, a veiled warning about an uh, impending crisis in the church or anything like that. You know, I know uh, we hear the word division and we often get very concerned because unfortunately the reality is we've had and experienced some division over the years. I'm not uh, sitting here trying to say that there's impending division. I'm not trying to garner support for one side or the other. Rather, I'm saying it's an unfortunate thing that has happened over the years. It happened to ancient Israel, and it's happened to us. So what I'd like to do today is look at this initial story of division in the ancient kingdom of Israel and see if we can learn a few lessons from it that we can apply throughout our lives, whenever we might experience a division, whether it's something on a grand scale or something on a small and personal scale within relationships. With that being said, let's get into the story. After, uh, or the first king, rather, that God uh, allowed to be appointed was King Saul. King Saul had a few issues. He wasn't uh, a terrible leader at the beginning, but he began to stray away from trusting in God. His heart wasn't in the right place, so King David was appointed as the first, uh, really the first king that, that God had appointed. If you read through, you see that uh, Saul was really sort of more uh, uh, appointed by people, but that's another subject for another day. David built the empire, so to speak, but he too had some issues. The kingdom then was left to his son, Solomon. Solomon reigned in peace, but unfortunately there were some problems, and that's where we'll start. And let's turn over to the book of 1 Kings. First 
1 Kings, we're going to start in chapter 11. You might put a marker here. We'll be in this section of 1 Kings 11 and 12 quite a bit today. 1 Kings 11. We'll start in verse 1. It says, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and the Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn your heart after other gods. Solomon clung to these in love. So here God gave him a warning, but he didn't listen. It says, And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place in Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people in Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Solomon did exactly what God told him not to do, and exactly what God said would happen if he did it, happened. Solomon didn't just slip up one time. He did that for all his wives, and he had 700 wives. So that's a whole lot of false gods and idols out there to be worshipped. Verse 9. Notice the consequence. It says, So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel, who had departed to who had appeared to him twice. It says, and commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant with my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you, and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen." Notice God says, I will tear the kingdom apart. He doesn't say that someone else is going to. God here steps up and takes full responsibility for what's going to happen. The first lesson in division, then, is this. God doesn't cause division, but he does work through it. God doesn't cause division, but he does work through it. Notice what's said in verse 11. It says, Because you have done this and have not kept my commandments and statutes which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Well, God is clearly taking control and responsibility for for what's about to happen, it's not his fault that this action had to occur. It's kind of like if somebody goes in and and robs a bank and then they're fleeing and there's a police chase and there's a shootout and the bank robber gets shot and killed. Is it the police officer's fault that the bank robber got shot and killed? No, he's doing his job. He's taking responsibility and doing what he needs to do, but it's the bank robber's fault. It's Solomon's fault for going after foreign gods. But God says, no, I'm going to take responsibility. God didn't cause the division, but he took responsibility for what's about ready to happen. You know, Solomon knew what was expected of him from the outset. If you keep your finger here and turn back a few chapters to 1 Kings chapter 2, you'll see that before he even becomes king, his father David gives him some sound advice. 1 Kings 2 verse 1 says, Now the days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. And I said, I'm getting ready to die, just like everything does eventually. He says, Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. 
and keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commands, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning to me, saying, If your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and all their soul, he said, You shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So father to son here, David to Solomon says, listen, if you follow God in all his ways, God says he'll extend that promise to you just as he did to me. If you go over a chapter after King David dies and Solomon is presented with an opportunity to have anything he wants and he wisely chooses wisdom, notice what the Lord says to Solomon, 1 Kings 3 verse 10. He says, this speech pleased the Lord, so this was after Solomon had asked for wisdom, uh, that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have you asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of the enemies, or your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding uh, and to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there uh, has not been anyone like you before you, no, uh, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings of all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. So God confirms what David had told Solomon. You must walk and obey God's word. You must walk in his ways. Solomon knew exactly what the expectations were of him. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we know and understand those expectations as well, or at least we should. Keep your finger here. Let's go forward in the New Testament to Hebrews chapter 6, reading verse 4. Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 4. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew uh, them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put to him an open shame. God says, once I give you my Holy Spirit, there's an expectation. There's an expectation for you to have a changed heart, one that's going to follow me, one that is going to be sincere, one that shows the fruits of repentance, which are spoken about in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It's a reminder that God doesn't expect us to go back to our old ways. Oh, he knows we're human. We'll make mistakes. We'll slip up. We'll fall short of the glory of God. We all do. But we don't turn back to our own ways. You know, Solomon couldn't turn to other gods, turn back away from God, yet that's what he did. Just as he did with Solomon, God tells us that there is an expectation and that we'll be judged by it. If we choose not to obey God, we cause a division. Again, we won't turn there for sake of time, but Isaiah 59 verse 2 reminds us that sin separates us from God. When we choose to sin, we are dividing ourselves away from God. God doesn't cause that division, but he does use it. He uses an opportunity to discern, to judge our hearts, our character. He certainly did with Solomon. As we'll see in a bit, he did with Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And he does with us today. Continuing back in 1 Kings 11, picking up the story in verse 26, 1 Kings 11, we see where Jeroboam enters the scene. 1 Kings 6, or excuse me, 1 Kings 11, verse 26. It says, Then Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, an Ephraimite from Zereda, whose mother's name was Zeruhah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. 
Solomon had built the, uh, the Milo and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. It says here that Jeroboam rebelled against Solomon. And technically, that's true. But does that make him a bad guy, at least at this moment in time in the story? Consider this. When Israel rose up to leave Egypt, were they rebelling against the Egyptians? Yeah. <laughs> if your boss tells you, you got to come in and work on Saturday, and you say, I'm not going to do that. Are you rebelling against your boss? Technically speaking, yes, you are. But you're not sinning. You're doing what God says is right. We must be careful, especially as we read through this story, that we don't judge Jeroboam too quickly. Verse 28, continuing the story. You might also consider, too, the way it's written there. In verse 27, it says, And this is what caused him to rebel against the king doesn't necessarily mean that the, the words you know the, that immediately follow are the one and only reason. It's kind of launching into the story. You might consider that like the title to a chapter. And the rest of this particular uh, chapter goes on to tell the whole story. Verse 28, uh, was, excuse me, read verse 28, verse 29. It says, Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shionite met him on the way. And he had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. A prophet of God comes to see Jeroboam. Jeroboam didn't seek out the prophet. He didn't say, hey, tell me what I need to do in order to get, you know, ten twelfths of the kingdom here. The prophet comes to him. He tears up his new garment and he gives Jeroboam ten pieces. Verse 32, he says, But he shall save one tribe for the sake of my servant and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen uh, out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. And he goes on down and, and gives the list here. There's some debate amongst scholars on exactly you know what these ten tribes are and where the other one is. General consensus amongst most Bible scholars is that the one tribe uh, was the tribe of Judah, and half the tribe of Benjamin. And there's some who will debate whether that was the half tribe of Benjamin or not. But I think when you read through Bible history, it's very clear, but we won't get into all that uh, today. Verse 34, he gets into some specific details. It says, however, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand uh, because I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. Again, we see how important that is to God. It's a recurring theme that's mentioned. It says, but I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands and give it to you, ten tribes. And to his son I will give one tribe that my servant David may have a lamp for uh, me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen for myself, to put my name there. Verse 37, he says, so I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart desires and you shall be king over Israel. Who's saying this? <laughs> this is the prophet of the Lord saying this to Jeroboam. Jeroboam's not telling other people how it's going to be. God's telling Jeroboam how it's going to be. It said, Then it shall be, if you heed at all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did, then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. God actually gives the same promise to Jeroboam here that he did to Solomon, and that he did to David. It's at this point that I think we can draw out our second lesson. lesson. Even in the midst of division, God is fair. Even in the midst of division, 
God is fair. He is an equal opportunity God, you might say. He says the same thing to Jeroboam as he did Solomon. He says, listen to my word and I'll build your kingdom. Okay, remember, uh, Jeroboam is the one who was the government official. Rehoboam is the one who's the quote-unquote legitimate heir, son of Solomon. Not only does God make this equal and fair opportunity and offer to Jeroboam, he makes it to you and I today, and in fact, to anyone who will listen. Again, let's keep our fingers here and turn forward in the New Testament to John 10. John 10. John 10, we'll start in verse 1. John 10, verse 1. He says, Most assuredly, of course, this is Jesus Christ speaking. He says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Here, Jesus is drawing the comparison to himself, the true shepherd, and to those who would be false uh, shepherds or false preachers. Verse 3, it says, To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And we need to listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, just as Solomon needed to listen to the voice of the Lord and not to the voice of his wives and the strange gods. It's the same opportunity you and I have. Continuing in verse 7, Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go, and will go in and out and find pasture. The pasture that Jesus Christ speaks of, of course, uh, shows the kingdom of God, our ultimate goal. If we follow Jesus, we will be saved. That's what he says. Verse 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, what did God promise Solomon and Jeroboam if they followed? He said, I will extend your kingdom. I will bless you. Jesus Christ says the same to us. He says, if we listen to his voice, if we follow him, he said, I'm going to give you life and more abundant life. And of course, that doesn't mean that going is, the going will always be easy. We know that there's difficult times. But of course, ultimately, we understand that points us to the coming kingdom, to salvation. God offers this opportunity to all who will listen. Some now, the first fruits, others later on at an appointed time. But even when we see things coming down around us, even when the kingdom is fracturing or the nation we live in begins to splinter, or God forbid, the church we attend experiences divisive issues, God is fair. God is fair. Note something very encouraging in this regard if we go back to to 1 Kings 11. He extends this offer to Jeroboam. In verse 39, it says, And I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. You know, David's descendants, Solomon, Rehoboam, they were going to be afflicted by this division. But he says, right here, he says, that's not going to last forever. We get a tiny little glimpse into the millennium. You know, again, we won't turn there for sake of time, but we know we're reading Ezekiel 37 and Jeremiah 30 that uh, David will rule over the 12 tribes. Uh, his descendants have been physically afflicted since the time of the split, but God says that won't last forever. No matter what trials we might face, God is in charge. The hurt and the pain that divisions cause are only temporary as long as we continue to adhere to God's statutes and commands to follow the shepherd's voice. Continuing with our story here, let's read a little bit about Rehoboam now. King Solomon dies. 
the rightful, quote unquote, rightful heir, the blood descendant of Solomon, Rehoboam, uh, begins to rise here in power. Verse 43, we'll actually pick it up at the uh, very end. Uh, 1 Kings 11, verse 43, said, Then Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. Continuing in chapter 12, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So Solomon's son, Rehoboam, is the rightful heir. The nation nat naturally presumes that, okay, he is going to be the new king. He had that right. But it's worth considering this. I just want to plant this thought in the back of your head for a moment. Does being right make you righteous? Does being right make you righteous? Just think about that as we go on and read through this story. Chapter, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of King Solomon and had been dwelling in Egypt that they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. Oh, Jeroboam had, uh, after he had received the news that he would uh, be given 10 twelfths of the kingdom, word got back to Solomon. Solomon wanted to kill him. So Jeroboam had gone down, been hiding in Egypt. After Solomon died, he kind of comes back and, and he's asking a question. He's not doing anything wrong here. He's asking Rehoboam. He respected Rehoboam, the king at that time, and then ask him a question. He said, you know, what kind of king are you going to be? Verse 5, so he said to them, depart for three days and come to back, back to me. And the people departed. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived and said, How do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. And they basically said, uh, Be a nice guy, continue to toe the line, be just like your pops was, and, and everything will be okay. Verse 6, or excuse me, verse 8. It says, but he rejected the advice which the elders had given him, and he consulted the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. This was his crew, you know, his posse, whatever you want to call them, his friends. He said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer the people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. Uh, I'm reminded of an old Flintstones cartoon. There was a, there was a bad guy character, and they kind of themed him after the, uh, the James Bond character, Goldfinger, only this guy was Stonefinger, and he had a finger made out of stone. He'd go around smashing stuff off with just this little finger, and that's what I always think about, you know, with this. He says, And now, whereas my father put a heavy boat, uh, yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So, so Jeroboam and the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. And the king answered to the people roughly, rejected the advice from which the elders had given him, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So he says, Wait till you get a load of this. You know, you thought the old man was tough. <laughs> New sheriff in town. It's going to be really rough. Verse 15 says, So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of the events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Neb uh, you know, the writer inserts a comment. Remember where this story started? <laughs> Who's in charge? What's going on? Verse 16, it says, Now when all Israel heard uh, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. And now, so people begin to fraction. They recognized that Rehoboam, the grandson of, of David, was going to be a tough king. And they said, you know, what do we want to have to do with this guy? Everybody go back 
on your own. So we see the fracture really start to take hold, not just between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, but among the people. Verse 17, it says, But Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue, but all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So, you know, Rehoboam has the southern stronghold. He decides he's going to go and show him who's boss, collect taxes. And, you know, he wound up, uh, the tax collector there, Abram, uh, Adoram, wound up uh, paying with his life. So the division is really sinking in now. Verse 19, it says, So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. You know, Jeroboam wasn't solely responsible for this. Now, the people had a hand in it. it, says the whole house of Israel. They got their hands dirty too. The third lesson then I want for us to draw during times of division is that having the right doesn't necessarily make you righteous. Or being right doesn't necessarily make you righteous. I had an experience years ago that kind of uh, uh, reminded me of, or, of this. There was a place where I worked where there was uh, a regular secretary for a division. She had to go on medical leave for a while. So a new secretary was hired in her place. She was very young, very attractive young lady. And it became pretty quickly, there was some friction in the office between some of the other younger ladies who got to be a little jealous of this new temporary girl. Pretty soon, rumors started flying. They started calling name, her names behind her back, saying that she was, you know, having affairs or sleeping around and, and things like this. Got pretty nasty for a little bit. And eventually, <laughs> that girl uh, wound up leaving because the original secretary came back and, and come to find out there were a few issues. There were a few things missing from the supply cabinet and come to find out that this temporary secretary had been taking a few things. The reaction from the other young women in the office who didn't like her much was, aha, we were right. We knew she was a tramp. She was no good. Well, they were right on one technical detail, but was it right of them to treat her so rudely the entire time <laughs> to call her names, spread rumors about her? Mm, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Translate that into the church when it comes to division. You know, maybe I'm in a position of authority in some way. I'll use the example of, of doing sound, and this isn't a reflection of our of our people who are doing sound. This this draws on my experiences from working in sound crew and some of the mistakes that I made. You know, there's times uh, I remember when we had to get a hall set up and we were running short on time. And, you know, I needed to run a cable and there were some people standing in the way and, you know, got pretty curt saying, hey, come on, move it, move it. I need to get this done. We got to get church started in 10 minutes. I need you to get out of the way, yada, yada, yada. You know, as the guy in charge of getting sound set up, did I have the right to do that? Yeah, <laughs> I had the right. But was it a very righteous attitude to be so rough and rude to people? I mean, could I be a little bit nicer and ask them to move over? I need to, could I please, you know, get through here? I need to lay this, this, uh, these wires down. Think about this at home, you know, as the father. Uh, do I have the right to say, okay, you know, this is what I want watched on TV tonight. This is what we're all going to watch. Well, you know, uh, as dad, I have some oversight, but that doesn't mean I should be an ogre. You know, as mom over the children, can you yell and scream at the kids and say, go clean your room, it's a mess, you need to do this, you need to do that. And believe me, I mean, you know, there's a time, we've all been there, but we have to be very careful not to abuse our authority and whatever it might be, whether it's as the king of a country or whether it's as a husband, a wife, a mom, a dad. The book of 1 Corinthians is well known as a book of correction. So again, leave your finger here, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians 16 at the very end of the book. Paul had been correcting the Corinth church for the first 15 chapters, more or less. 
But notice what he says at the conclusion. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. In other words, be right, <laughs> do the right things. Verse 14, he says, let all that you do be done with love. Yeah, we have the right, the responsibility to stand fast, to be strong, to be faithful. But as we do so, we need to make sure that we do it with love and not out of tyranny. Jeroboam had the right to do, or excuse me, Rehoboam had the right to do what he wanted as king. He abused his authority and he sowed even deeper seeds of discord and division in Israel. You and I must be cautious that even though we might be right in a situation, we proceed with love, with care, not without love and concern as Rehoboam did. Let's turn back to 1 Kings 12, continue the story here. We'll see it's not over yet. Rehoboam had announced that he was going to be a tyrant. Jeroboam is starting to get a following here. 1 Kings 12, verse 20, it says, Now it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back. Remember, he was kind of on the lamb down in Egypt for a while. So it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over Israel. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So we see this division really becomes formal at this point. And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So Rehoboam puts together an army and says, we're going to put an end to this insurrection. It says, but the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Remember, God doesn't cause division, but he takes responsibility. He steps in to stop some bloodshed here. He says, let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore they obeyed the word of the Lord and turned back according to the word of the Lord. The two kingdoms are ready to go to war. Just on Rehoboam's side alone, which was the smaller side, there were 180,000 warriors. This would have been a, a civil war, and historically speaking, civil wars are the nastiest of wars. Uh, usually take the most deaths, certainly the most innocent lives. Just a quick number, set of numbers I looked up. Uh, in the United States during World War II, there were around uh, 290,000 soldiers killed and relatively few civilians. Uh, the Civil War, there were 215,000, so you know, considerably fewer soldiers killed. But non-combat casualties, when you start to factor them all in, the Civil War jumps to 655,000 casualties. That's about three times the number who died. Three times just the soldiers that died. There was going to be a lot of bloodshed. God took responsibility. He stepped in and stopped it. Through this division, it became apparent that Rehoboam was not going to be a good king. He would be hard. He would be cruel. He would be the opposite of his father. At the same time, God was using this to test the hearts of the people. Would they go about and create war? Or would they stop and listen to the prophet here and keep from going around, going about killing each other? If we were to close the book right here, We'd walk away thinking, you know, Jeroboam wasn't such a bad guy after all. He was just a little misunderstood. He was just doing what God told him to do. Rehoboam was the real scoundrel, the guy who really caused so much problem. And if the story stopped here, that would be true. That was true for a while. But if we continue reading, we see that things actually change very, very quickly. 
verse 25, says, Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. And also he went out from there and built Peniel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to the house of David. If the people go up to offer sacrifices in the houses of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the people will turn back to the Lord, to their Lord, lowercase l, notice, their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Now, while it's uncertain if Jeroboam was seeking to promote himself at the beginning when God said, I'm going to use you to tear the kingdom from Solomon, it becomes clear what's in his heart now, doesn't it? He says, I don't want to lose this. I don't want the, the hearts of the people to turn back to Rehoboam. I'm going to do something about it. Verse 28 says, Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you out from the land of Egypt. He set one up in Bethel and another one in Dan. So then that would have been the northern and southern, or actually respectively southern and northern uh, regions of the northern kingdom. So that, that way nobody had to go too far to worship God, trying to make it a convenience for them. It says, now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not the sons of Levi. Jeroboam makes a counterfeit religion. That's what it comes down to. He makes a counterfeit religion. While he was not necessarily rebelling against God before, he was rebelling against Rehoboam. Now he's rebelling against God. Verse 32 says, Jeroboam ordained a feast in the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places that he had made. So he, um, so he made offerings on the altar, which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month which he had devised in his own heart. It says, and he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. No, he made a counterfeit religion and let anybody who wanted to be one a priest. That's bad. <laughs> then he comes up with his own set of holy days. That's worse. That brings us to our fourth and final point. No, Jeroboam had appeared up to this point to be doing the right thing that God's hand was with him. But when it comes to division, we must learn to be patient and wait on God. When it comes to divisive issues, when it comes to division, we must be patient and wait on God. Imagine for a moment, if you will, that you were a citizen living in Jerusalem when all this happened. You were a citizen that lived during the reign of King Solomon. It's getting near the end of King Solomon's time and you hear word of some sort of a split. This Jeroboam fellow who supposedly was going to rebel against the king and is, is now down in Egypt. Uh, you know that Rehoboam is the son of King Solomon, so it seems by all intents and purposes he has the, the right to the throne. His father dies and he becomes king and all seems good at first, but then when you kind of find out what sort of a king he is, he's not a very good guy. <laughs> but nevertheless, he's the rightful heir. God must have placed him in that role, right? Now you hear Jeroboam is coming back. Jeroboam is coming back and he is going to steal the kingdom away from the rightful heir, Rehoboam. So being the dutiful citizen of Jerusalem you are, you gird on your armor, your sword, you and 180,000 of your fellow soldiers begin to march north towards Jeroboam and that rebellious king. And on the way there, a prophet from God comes and says, no, 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 this is God's doing. Don't go and fight and destroy Jeroboam. Convinced now that clearly <laughs> King Jeroboam must be in the right you decide to leave your home in Jerusalem, move north to live under King Jeroboam's reign, only to find out a few months later that King Jeroboam begins setting up his own priesthood, his own false holy days. Now what do you do? Well, if you're looking for guidance, 
from either Jeroboam and Rehoboam in this story, you're not going to uh, find it, unfortunately. You're going to be very, very disappointed. Let's just note quickly what God has to say. It's not our place to judge Jeroboam or Rehoboam, but God's words are pretty clear in their case. 1 Kings 14. First King, verse 14. It's getting at the end of Jeroboam's range. First Kings 14, verse 14. It says, Moreover, the Lord will raise up for himself a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is the day, what? Even now. For the Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He will uproot Israel from this good land which he gave to their fathers and will scatter them beyond the river because they have made their wooden images provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who sinned and who made Israel sin. I think it's pretty clear from that. Jeroboam was not judged a good king in God's eyes. If we continue reading, though, a little bit farther, over in verse 21, it says, And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king. He reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of the tribes of Israel to put his name there. Uh, skipping on down, verse 22, it says, Now Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. Judah, of course, are the occupants that, that Rehoboam was reigning over there in Jerusalem. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they committed more than their fathers had done. For they built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every hill and under every given tree. And there were uh, also perverted persons in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So... King Rehoboam turned out not to be very good king overall. And if we read through there to the very end of this chapter, we see what the ultimate result is. Verse 29 says, Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. Here you have two warring kings. These warring kings warred all the time. The people were embroiled in disputes and civil wars. And even after the kings were dead and gone, they left behind friction, division amongst the people. Once again, sad to say, that's not an unfamiliar story to us today in the Church of God, is it? something that we've had to deal with a few times over our, our history. While being patient and waiting on God is the right thing to do, the truth is it's extremely hard to accomplish. Ancient Israel couldn't do it, and the modern church's track record isn't a whole lot better. So in the time remaining, I'd like to leave us with two practical pieces of advice when it comes to learning to wait on God during potentially divisive times, whether they be big or whether they be small. Let's begin looking at this first piece of advice in a writing from the Apostle Paul to the young minister Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, picking up in verse 3, it says, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And it's a doctrine, actual teaching, it's very important, Paul says. It says, Nor give he to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes, or in some translations say divisions, rather than godly edification which is in faith. Paul says, don't listen to the rumor mills, the useless stuff. Worrying about things, oh, do we need to go observe new moons? Do I need to use a special sacred name when it comes to referring to Jesus Christ? Paul says, stick to the doctrines you were taught. 
stick to those things which Paul and the other first century apostles spent their time preaching and teaching about. Faith, repentance, salvation, the kingdom of God, having the mind of Christ. These are the important things we need to focus on. He reaffirms a few chapters over here in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 7. He reaffirms not to waste our time and rumors. 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, it says, Reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. No, he says this stuff that's just kind of rumors, that's just kind of nuances, he says it's profane. <laughs> you know what profane is, right? It's unholy, things that are unholy, which is the opposite of what we are to be. He says reject that sort of thing. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, again, we get some very practical advice in Paul's writings over in Romans, the very end of the book of Romans, chapter 16. Romans 16, verse 17. Romans 16, verse 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn, and avoid them. Once again, Paul points to the core fundamental teachings, the doctrines. He said when people start to talk about things that can be divisive, he said avoid them. Avoid that conversation. Notice it doesn't say remove them. <laughs> That's the role of the ministry. Right? If there's somebody being divisive and being an issue, the ministry will take care of that and handle that. But it tells us, you know, if we begin to hear divisive rumors, things that can cause to us to be led away from God to the core teachings, it says avoid it. Get away from it. So the first piece of practical advice is simply this. Don't listen to garbage. Don't listen to garbage. Don't listen to things that can become divisive, things that can take us away from the core teachings, the core doctrines, the trunk of the tree. Simply put, put don't listen to it. The second bit of practical advice I'd like for us to consider comes into play when things get a little more serious. Maybe we can't avoid the rumor mill. Maybe it's something that keeps coming back to us and we just can't steer clear of it. No matter what happens, you keep getting dragged into it. Then consider these two things. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs, or go to the book of Proverbs, rather. Oops. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16, verse 27. Here, Solomon, who unfortunately learned a little too late in life, things that uh, cause division, writes this. It says, An ungodly man digs up evil and is on his lips like a burning fire. A perversive man sows strife, and a whisper separates the best of friends. A violent man entices his neighbors and leads him away uh, that in a way that is not good. He winks his eye to devise perverse thing. He purses his lips and brings about evil. What's this talking about? Now it's talking about those who bear those sorts of rumors. If we can't avoid them, then what do we need to do? It says consider the source, basically. <laughs> consider the source. Where is this coming from? Why is this being said? Is what they say something you can trust? Or do you need to take it with a grain of salt? Actually, I got to thinking about that phrase and I wasn't sure of the origins of it. So I looked up the origins of the phrase, you know, taking something with a grain of salt. Apparently in, in medieval times, it was thought that salt would be an antidote to poison. So if somebody that you were maybe a little suspect of gave you something to drink, you were supposed to put some salt in it and drink it. So to counteract the the effects of the poison. And I thought, how priceless is that? You know, because words can be poison too. Words can be poison too. We have to consider what's being said. Question becomes then, how do we take it with a grain of salt? 
of that, let's go to our final scripture for today. Proverbs 18, verse 17. Proverbs 18 and verse 17 says the first one to pleads his to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. You know, hearing one side of the story rarely gives us a complete picture. People tend to shade things to to make it look like what they're saying is right. Consider what Jeroboam did with his false holy days. What did he do first? <laughs> he said, anybody who wants to be a priest, come be a priest. Avoided, appointed friends to it. You know. Then he set up, well, hey, you know what? I'm, go I'm going to make it easy. It's too hard for you to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship. I'll make it easy for you. I'm going to set up a couple of other tabernacles. And I want to set up a new holy day on the, the, the 15th day of the eighth month. <laughs> well, you know why that might almost sound right, right? Well, the 15th day of the seventh month, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, this counterfeit day that Jeroboam came up with sounded right. He shaded things to make it seem like what he was doing was right. And if they didn't pay close enough attention, it might seem okay. If people would have talked to legitimate priests, if people would go examine the scriptures, study what the other side of the story was, they would have not been deceived. Our second bit, then, of practical advice when it comes to being patient and waiting on God is make sure you know the whole story. If a situation becomes divisive and you can't avoid it, make sure you have all the information that you need. And certainly in matters of doctrine, we need to go to the Bible to understand the real source, what the right side of the story actually is. Jeroboam and Rehoboam were the first two kings of this divided monarchy. While one was the quote-unquote legitimate blood heir, the other one was appointed by God for a special purpose. But because of their sins and their actions, neither one of them was actually a very good king. And the kingdom wound up divided. Division is never pleasant. But reality is, it does happen. It has happened. It happens on grand scales, as it did in ancient Israel. We see in our own nation today, people becoming divided over politics and all sorts of things. We've seen it happen on a smaller but equally painful scale in the church over the years. And on a personal level, we find ourselves divided from one another at times. But hopefully by remembering that God does not cause division. Although he may use it to sift our hearts, God doesn't cause it. Remembering that God is indeed fair, even when things are painful and it hurts to see what's happening, to know that God is being fair. And to remember that, you know, being right doesn't necessarily make us righteous. Having the authority to do something doesn't mean we should always use it. And finally, being patient and waiting on God, tuning out the negativity, the rumors, the innuendos, and when you do find it necessary to make a decision, getting the whole story. If we practice these things, we can have godly discernment even during divisive times.